Thank you, Bert. Any news this morning, Daddy? This fellow Gaylord is attacking us again. Well, well, maybe he doesn't mean us. He never mentions names, and people are always imagining but that... he says a prominent broker. But, but there are a lot of prominent brokers. Yes, but there aren't lots of prominent brokers who have specialized in foreign bond issues. I haven't done anything wrong, Cornelia. I've even protected my investors with my own money. But I'm afraid of this fellow Gaylord. Well, I wouldn't let it worry me. Well, the whole thing wouldn't amount to anything if it weren't for the circulation this fellow's column has. He's liable to make some of my clients panicky and die. Well, couldn't you talk to him, Daddy, and reason with him? Well, I have talked. The man is actually drunk with power. As long as he has a million newspaper readers and 50 million radio fans who make his $5,000 a week salary possible, why should he worry about me? Well, maybe if I talked to him and told him what a dear old daddy you are. It wouldn't do a bit of good, Cornelia. And besides, I don't want you mixed up in anything like this. When I get downtown, I'll call up Carr, the publisher of Gaylord's paper. He's an old friend of mine. I might get him to curb Gaylord. skunk and put an end to this once and for all. Oh, no, no, Joe. Then he might publish the whole story. If he ever publishes that story, it'll be the last one he'll ever print. Don't let it upset you, darling. I wonder they couldn't leave us alone when we're so happy. What are you going to do about it? Do about it? I'm going to read my grapefruit. But Ernie, stories like this will bring the feds down on you. And you can't arrange protection with Uncle Sam. Okay. How about a little rub out for Mr. Gaylord? Don't be a sap. And bump off a newspaper man like Gaylord? Yeah. Just let one of our boys play a tune on his violin. And you'll find that these collium, these, these, these mugs bump off just as easy as anybody else. No, Tony. I appreciate your good intentions, but I'll take care of Mr. Gaylord in my own sweet way. Oh, Perkins. Yes, sir. Remind me to call Mr. Gaylord of the uh, Daily Star Express. Invite him to go to the hockey matches with me this evening. Very good, sir. The... The... So you're going to invite him to the hockey matches? I suppose when you're locked up in Atlanta Penitentiary, you just want to send Mr. Gaylord a card of thanks. Give him a reward. And make him on a hair in your will. Our love song
Hello, operator. Operator, get me the number of the Daily Star Express. <laughs> Listen to this. Evidently, our esteemed police commissioner thinks that a crime wave is something you must sell. There have been 63 unsolved murders in the city in the last six months. Possibly the police department is waiting for the number to become an even 100 before taking action. Uh, Chief, we do everything we know. Yes, but you don't know enough. This time I'm putting a man on your squad who'll get results. Who do you mean? I'm assigning Bill Hamilton to your detail beginning this morning. Hamilton? Well, he's practically a kid. He never had any experience in a job like yeah? this. Well, I'll take a chance on that. After seeing the way he reorganized the Identification Bureau, I've got a hunch he'll teach you guys a lot. Yeah? All right, send Bill Hamilton in. Yeah. Good morning, Commissioner. Hello, Denny. Great day for a murder. Uh, hello, Bill. I've been telling O'Brien about assigning you to his squad. I imagine as much from the happy expression on Denny's face when I came in the door. <laughs> hey, Bill, I wish you'd hop over to that Cooper apartment and see what you can figure out. Well, I've already been there, Commissioner, and I have figured it out. I thought you were supposed to be taking orders from me. Oh, I'm sorry, Denny, but I read about it in the paper. Yeah, now, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. You say you figured it out, huh? Well, what was it? Murder or suicide? Suicide. Yeah, what makes you so sure? Well, the powder marks on the wound, the angle at which the bullet entered the skull, and all the rest of the findings. Well, that's all very pretty. A man don't bump himself off just because he don't like the weather. What was the motive? Well, you fellas missed the item because it was blotted out by Cooper's blood. I got a hold of another paper and read this story. It seems that Cooper's been playing around with a lot of dames, and his wife found out about it. Then Gaelic's story was enough to present at his election, and on top of that, his wife's threatened suit for divorce would have killed his political career. How did you find out about her divorce suit? Well, I hopped in the cab and went over and saw him. I know how you feel about it, Burbank, old man. I'll see what I can do. Well, confidentially, Carl, most of my accounts are old trust funds. And when interest dividends lapsed, I've been paying out the interest myself, but my own cash is practically gone. And if Gaylor keeps hammering at me, my customers will stampede and drive me into bankruptcy. All right, Jerome. I'll have a talk with Gaylord. Burbank, the broker, asking me to make Gaylord lay off of him. Well, I've got about as much chance as muzzling a lion. And Burbank is no. I've had calls this morning from Joe Reynolds, Percy Dale, and a half a dozen others. Well, I don't find it difficult to operate my column without antagonizing people. I don't know why he can't. That's because you run a column, Halliburton, not a nationwide institute for slander. Well, after all, Mr. Carr, your paper, I should think you could dictate his policy. Not with Gaylord's contract. He can say anything he pleases short of libel. And he's smooth enough never to mention anybody's name. Consequently, nobody can get anything actionable on him. Well, you wanted a million circulation, you hired Gaylord, and you got him. Yes, and if I could get rid of him tomorrow, I'd be willing to drop back to 100,000 and keep a few of my friends. How long does his contract run? Two years. Well, I shouldn't think it'd be difficult to get rid of a nuisance like Gaylord. Listen, Hal Burton, you help me get rid of that muckraker, and you can run his column, and I'll triple your present salary. I don't care how you do it. Get him to settle his contract. Have another paper, hire him. Anything. Okay. How's Mr. Hartrog this morning? Oh, ticking right along, thanks. How are things with you? Up to my neck in mud. Ah, but it's pay dirt, isn't it? <laughs> I'll say so. There's gold in these here gossips. Say, you're not falling for this gossiper by any chance, are you? Why, <laughs> don't be silly. Uh, we had a date last night, didn't we? Oh, I'm sorry, sweet. Carl called me out to his house and I didn't get away until after midnight. But Sally, I've got to see you tonight. Right after you leave. Something important? Terribly important. Ah, Miss Burbank in person. And if it isn't all Heisey himself. Mr. Gaylord, I'd like to speak to you, please. And I got a few things I want to say to you. 
Uh, you'll have to wait. I haven't read my mail yet. I've got to find out who's suing me. Good morning, George. Uh, you mean good evening. I haven't had a wink yet. Uh, you can't land anything looking over transfers in the daytime. <laughs> how are you, George? Uh, what are you doing here? Getting some points on how to run a real column? Maybe on how not to run a column. Yeah. Well, the best way to find that out is to read your own. Come on, darling. Any new dirt? Cooper suicided. The police claim your story. Yeah, I hid it along the main stem. Just another guy who couldn't take it. We're having a lot of complaints, George. How about toning down a little for a while, huh? Ah, now don't you go spongy on me, baby. Who's been squawking? Well, Joe Reynolds called up and raised the roof, and so did old man Burbank. When he couldn't get you, he switched to car. I also got a tip off that any paddock is talking to his trigger men. Of course, those are the important ones, and there's dozens of smaller pies. Just a lot of poor fish who get hooked by their own recklessness, and then flop around when they're drawn up into the sunlight. Celebrities are made and paid by the public. The public has a right to know the real inside dope on their darling. As long as the public keeps supporting the Gaylord knows for news, they're going to get their money's worth. Okay, George, you know me. I'm for you. Only, I don't want to see you get yourself in a jam. Uh, don't worry, baby. I hold up coattails when I walk through the mud. <laughs> <laughs> What's new in the Breast Event Department this morning? Well, let's see. Oh, the Vanderwells have an eight-pound baby boy. Yeah, and when I prophesied the event three months ago, they denied it. One of these days, the saps will find out who stands in with the stork in this town, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and what's exciting in the milking part? Well, there's a rumor about the J.V. Carson. All right, remind me to write a story in a week that the cousins are being divorced. But that is only a rumor. Listen, when she reads that yarn I'm printing about him tomorrow, she'll be renovating. Who's talking in Honeymoon Lane these nights? Well, I got a report that Ellery Manning and Jessica Snow are sizzling. Oh, no. I saw her out with another guy at the old nightclub. Remind me to put it in today's column. You better go easy, George. That Manning's a bad boy in his cups. He might go gunning for that dame. Well, then we'll have a scoop on the murder. <laughs> Type up my notes for today, will you? And, uh, tell Cinderella she can see the big bad wolf. <laughs> All right. Burbank. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Well, what can I do for you? I certainly do enjoy reading your column, Mr. Gaylord. So do I. I think you're the most brilliant figure in American journalism today. Now again, we agree. Present-day writers seem to follow the beaten path so much. It's refreshing to find one who's so individual. My, my, and I thought we were going to have an argument. And here we are agreeing on everything. Oh, no. I didn't come up here to argue with you. I'm just one of your many fans who's tired of worshipping from afar. He decided I'd come up and see what an idol is really like. <laughs> oh, I'm really quite flattered. Oh, you're so subtle, Miss Burbank. Subtle? Yes, yeah, subtle. Like a train wreck. Why, I don't know what you mean. Just how long is it going to take you to get to the point of asking me not to attack your father in my column? Why, uh, why, I... You're wasting your time. I make too much money to be bribed by the Burbank Million. And as for the allure of your beautiful face and figure, my column calls it sex repeal. It's true, Mr. Gaylord. I did come up here to ask you to leave my father alone. He hasn't done anything really wrong. Oh, no, no. Outside of investing trust funds in South American and foreign stocks that aren't worth a dime, he hasn't done a thing. But he'll make up every set of it, if he only just gets a little time. Well, if I have anything to do with it, that's just what he will get. Time. I think you're the most despicable, evil-minded man I've ever met. Oh. On the 
contrary, I'm really quite high-minded. Otherwise, I might put two and two together and imagine that you were at Cooper's apartment last night around the time he was supposed to have killed himself. You wouldn't dare publish that. Oh, don't tempt me. I can resist anything but temptation. If you ever publish another thing about my father and I me... I know, I know, I know, I know. You shoot me with a revolver. Yes, sir? Oh, Sally, uh, Miss Burbank is having difficulty in finding the door. Maybe you could help her out. Oh. <laughs> well? Oh, yes, uh, tell little Miss Muffet he may come in now. Yes, sir. Mr. Dale. Don't you dare strike me. I'll scream. I told you a month ago, if you ever published another story about me, I'd... Yeah, that's right. You and 10,000 others. Well, why do you keep picking on me? Well, I'll tell you. It's really a personal affair. The first time I heard your voice over the radio, I... I fell in love with you. Imagine my embarrassment when I found out you were a man. Why, you scandal-monging, character-wrecking, heartbreaking... Listen, you golden voice, you glow. You better watch your step for one of these days. I'll print the real story about you. The one about the breach of promise suit you spent 50 grand to keep out of the newspapers. Dealer, the day you publish that story will be your last. Hello? Oh, hello, Ernie. Will you get out of here before you feel a song coming on? Yeah. Pretty good, Ernie. I thought you might be peeved with me. <laughs> Everybody else in town is. But that... Oh, the hockey matches. Sure, I'll drop in there with you before I start making the rounds, huh? Okay, George. I'll, um, I'll pick you up at your apartment. The hockey matches. Why don't you invite him up and play post office? Cigarette, George? Oh, thanks. You get a great kick out of that racket of yours, don't you, George? Yeah. I like to hear them squawk. A lot of guys can take it on the chin, but not in a headline. <laughs> hey, this isn't the way to the hockey matches. Suppose I told you we weren't going to the hockey matches. What do you mean? Where are you taking me? Suppose I told you we were just, um, just taking you for a little ride. A lot of guys who couldn't keep their mouths shut and talked a whole lot less than you have been taken for a ride. Why, well, you wouldn't dare bump off a newspaper man. Remember what the guy got that shot Jake Lingo? True. Ten years. But I'd rather take a chance on that than getting the hot seat because you talk too much. But I... Well, then, of course, I'm only supposed to. And I suppose you'll know better than to mention me in your column in the future. Drive back to the rink, Jack. Well, what, uh, what team are you betting on tonight, George? Well, I really hadn't thought. <laughs> <laughs> if I can get my hands on that fellow's neck. Permanent. Come on, break it up. Take your seat. Oh, 
shouldn't have done that. Joe, now he might publish the whole story. Who is that? If he does, he knows what he can expect. Joe, I'm so worried. Oh, all right, dear, all right. Well, I guess everything's ready. Sure, I'm ready for the fireworks. Put in the filter to cut out those overtones, Mr. Gaylord. Oh, that's fine, Mr. Dittmar. Thanks. All right, Sally, go out and hold down the fort. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, this is George Gaylord, your New York correspondent, bringing you gossip of the day from New York, where clothes make the man if the woman knows how to wear them. Oh, hello, Tony. What are you doing here? When am I ever going when I come to see Gaylord and company? Uh-huh. Got another tip, eh? A hot one. And it's going to cost you more jack. Mm-hmm. We'll shoot the story, and then we'll talk about the jack. Let's talk about the jack, and then we'll shoot the story. Well, I know George won't pay any more than $10. Ah, uh, he'll pay two bits for this one. It'll be the talk of the town in 24 hours. Mm-hmm. Well, how do I know it's worth it until I hear it? Listen, sister. If the big gab bag prints the story, I get the jack. If we don't, it's big. Okay. Shoot. A certain big-time gambler waltzed in a crap game this afternoon. You don't mean... The same. You're a smart girl, Sally. What does a welching mean these days? Oh, nothing. Except that a couple of the boys are looking for him with hardware where their handkerchiefs ought to be. And in a few days, said gambler will be pushing up daisies from underneath. Okay, Tony, come up to the office tomorrow and pick up your $25. This is hot. Why don't you let us spill it tonight? Because I can't go in. George is broadcasting and the door is locked. Well, ain't you got a key? No. Nope. Nobody but George and the Playhouse office has keys and they have strict instructions not to go in unless it's an emergency. Well, ain't there any more doors? Yep, two more, just like that. Locked. What's his idea in locking himself up like that? People make George nervous when he's broadcasting, and he doesn't like to be interrupted. Gee, this broadcaster now, but must think he's a big shot to go to all that trouble. Say, George is such a sensation on the air, this office would build him a gold tower if he wanted it. Huh. Well, if he's broadcasting now, why can't we hear him? Because the room is soundproof. You want to hear him? Uh, oh, sure. I, uh, I always listen to George when he's on the air. But I thought you said... That right across the hall, first door to the left. It's the old monitor room, but the loudspeaker is still in there. Thanks, Sally. Okay. Tell me to go that way. I told you to go left. Oh, left. My error. 
Thanks, Sally. And my broadcast tomorrow evening will be the last until after Christmas. However, those who listen in will enjoy a real treat. I shall tell a grand little story which will give the lowdown on a widely known New York figure. Don't forget the time, 8.30 Eastern Standard. The place, your radio, and the person is, well, you'll be surprised. Good night. Joe, I told you you shouldn't have hit him. Well, what did I do, Pearl? He's making us a laughing stock. Come on, not you'll ruin it. Not if I can get to him first. Joe, don't make it any worse. But Daddy, he may not mean you. Of course he does. Two of my customers were in the office this afternoon, raising a scene because of Gerhardt's stories. Well, maybe if I saw him again. Again? You mean you have seen him? You degraded yourself by trying to appeal to that upstart? Well, I... You shouldn't have done it, Cornelia. They're dragging you through the mud next. Before I'll allow that blackguard to attack my daughter and ruin my reputation, I'll... Give me morning sign. One, three, two, oh, seven. Hello, Paddock. Paddock, this is Percy Dale. Okay. Listen, Paddock. I've got a job for one of your gorillas. There's ten grand in it for him. Sorry, Dale. My boys are going to be busy for the next few days on a personal job for me. little boy blue blowing his horn. I'll say I heard him. When he shot off his mouth in the carlium the other day, you took him to the hockey matches. Now I suppose you'll invite him to tea at the Ritz. All right, all right. I was wrong. Thought I could throw a scare into him. Oh, I told you the only thing to throw into him was some lead. That guy's got to be muzzled before tomorrow night. You got any ideas? Certainly. I had a hunch Gaylord was going to need some lead poisoning before long. So I went over to the radio joint tonight to give his dame a tip and take a look around. Yeah, what'd you find out? I got the lay of the land. It'll be a cinch. When Mr. Gaylord broadcasts tomorrow night, he'll have a harp in his hand instead of a microphone. And his accompaniment will be Angel Serenade. Mr. Gaylord immediately. Yes, Mr. Burbank. Mr. Gaylord will send for me in a minute or so. These other gentlemen are waiting also. Thank you. I know, Mr. Dale. You want to see Mr. Gaylord immediately. You bet I want to see him. There's... Excuse me? nonsense. I promise my radio public a sensation, and you know I never disappoint them. Get them up your boy, Sally, and send off those packages. Yes, sir. As for those buzzers outside, tell them definitely. No one sees me until after the broadcast. Yes, sir. This suspense is terrible. If we only knew who it was that Gellert was going to talk about. I'm not so sure he's going to talk about anybody. Sorry, gentlemen, Mr. Gaylord will not see anyone until after the broadcast. What? Well, wait, well, this is reprehensible. He's going to see me right now. Take it just the trouble, Mr. Paddock. That door is securely locked from the inside. I might add that the other two doors are locked also. Hello, would you kindly send a messenger to Mr. Gaylord's office at the radio playhouse? Thank you.
It's about time for Gaylord to begin. Isn't there some place around here where we can listen to the broadcast? Oh, yes. There's a loud speaker in the old monitor room down the hall to the left. And leave the door open, Mr. Reynolds. Perhaps some of the other gentlemen might be interested in listening to the broadcast also. Let me in that room for a moment to talk to Gaylord. I'll give you fifteen thousand dollars. Why, Mr. Gale, that's almost enough money to weaken anybody's loyalty. Hello? Oh, uh, take care of these packages, will you? Okay. Your correspondent, George Gaylord, bringing you gossip of the day from New York. Where many a horse comes into the money on the last lap, and many a woman does, too. My sponsor and I take this opportunity to wish our millions of friends the compliments of the season. And now, my friends, we come to the piece de resistance. Our story is about a moth which has flown around the bright lights for a long time without singeing its feet. Here's the yarn. It's about... Stop! Stop! Don't kill me! Please! Shot through the neck. How'd that happen? I don't know, Lieutenant. I heard the shots in the control room. Rushed down here and found the doctor pounding on that door from the outside. Then we got the key from the manager's office. Rushed in here and found this. What do you mean you got a key? Was the door locked? Well, you see, Mr. Gaylord always broadcast behind locked doors. Gaylord's private secretary. Yeah, what are all these folks doing here? Well, they were afraid of what Mr. Gaylord was going to say over the radio tonight, and they came up here to stop him. And one of them did. All right. We'll question them later. No use any of you guys trying to get away from here now. Just sit down and take it easy. Wait a minute. Was something spilled here? Why, I know. Nothing that I can remember. What is it, Bill? Well, it was a wet spot. I wonder where it came from. How'd you get here so quick? Heard it all over the radio, Denny. Thought you'd be needing a medical examiner in a hurry. I guess not this time. Pretty clear how this fella died. <laughs> well, this is a funny one. I I thought this guy was shot. I'm well, sure he was shot. What do you mean? Well, I'd say he was stabbed. Stabbed? Yes, sir. Stabbed right through the carotid artery. That was practically instantaneous. Oh, you must be wrong, Doc. Well, there's 50 million radio fans who'll testify to haven't heard this guy shot. Mm, sure, and 50 million radio fans can be wrong. Can you definitely say, Doctor, that this man was not shot? Bullet wounds are sometimes misleading, you know. Well, you know, there are all kinds of bullets, and you never can tell what one of them is going to do. Of course, I might be wrong. You're wrong this time, all right. Well, the men are here from the Identification Bureau, Lieutenant. All right, tell them I'll see him in a few minutes, yes, sir. Now I get a hunch we're going to have much use for fingerprints and pictures on this job. Well, I think it'd be a good idea to have that spot on the floor analyzed. What do you think that is? Well, I couldn't tell you, Denny, until after the chemical analysis. Yeah, well, you can go in for all that scientific stuff if you want to. I tell you, the guy or the dame we're looking for is right in this thing, and I've got the gap with him that pulled the job. You go out and search everybody here. When you find a guy or a dame with a gap, you've got the killer.
These guns were taken from the persons of Joe Reynolds, Percy Dale, Ernie Paddock, Cornelia Burbank, and her father, Jerome Burbank. Every one of them had a gun, and every one of them had a motive for the killing. Well, it seems they didn't all shoot him. Say, has anyone that gun's been shot lately? Yeah, old man Burbank's. One bullet missing, but of course that doesn't mean anything. Why does it mean anything? That boat was found in the wall, wasn't it? Yes, but it was so flattened out that the ballistics department couldn't tell what gun it was fired from. And just because there weren't any bullets missing from the other guns doesn't mean to say that they haven't been fired. Why don't it? Well, because we found out in the ballistics department that anyone who knows a gun can fire it, clean it, and put another bullet in. Every one of these people had time to do that before they were searched. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Suppose we have them in here, one at a time. I asked him some questions. You took the words right out of my mouth, Chief. Well, don't you think, Commissioner, that we ought to look around a bit more before we start questioning people? Why? Well, there's a possible stabbing. We you haven't found a knife yet. You, you frisked him for a knife, didn't you? Yes, but we haven't found one yet. And you won't, because that guy was shot. Come in. I caught this lady trying to sneak out a side window, Chief. Ah, yeah, come in. Can I make a getaway, huh? What do I know? What do you got in that bag? Another get. Getting to be a regular gunman's convention. What's your name? Carl Reynolds. What are you doing here? What? I came after my husband. I was afraid he might get into trouble. Come after her husband with a get to keep him out of trouble. But I didn't do it. Really, I didn't. My husband didn't do it. How do you know your husband didn't do it, Mrs. Reynolds, when you admit that he came here looking for trouble? Well, he didn't come here looking for trouble. He came here the same as all the rest of them, to stop Gail from ruining his reputation and mine. But Joe didn't kill him. Why, well, he couldn't. And that remains to be seen. Get that guy Reynolds in here. Reynolds. Pearl, what are you doing here? Oh, Wait a minute. We'll do the question in here. Reynolds, you came here tonight with plenty of motive to kill Gaylord. You were found with a gun in your pocket. What about it? Well, the gun wasn't fired, was it? That don't mean a thing. Our ballistics department has proven that a smart guy like you can do a lot of tricks with a gun. Well, it's true. I came here to have a showdown with Gaylord about slandering me and my wife. I only brought the gun along to frighten him. I didn't shoot it. Where were you when the killing took place? Down the hall in front of the monitor room. Yeah? Can you prove it? I'm standing right beside Ernie Paddock. And Gaylord took me down what coming to him. I told Dorothy he'd get it sooner. Who do you think about the mall? Hogan Dow? Maybe you did. What? Maybe I did. Nobody knows but the guy that pulled the trigger. Well, I lost the best friend I've ever had. Yeah, I guess we'll all miss old George. Too bad you had to come here and get mixed up in all this, Cornelia. I know, Daddy. Oh, but I had to. I was afraid that if you saw me, Lord, you... You don't think I did it? Oh, no. No, of course not. All right, that'll do. Don't you folks try to get away from here, because nobody leaves this joint till I solve this thing. Well, I'd just like you to know that I've got a show opening next month. All right, you. Not you, him. But he's my father. I don't care if he's your fairy godmother. I'm talking to him alone. Why did you come here tonight? I wanted to talk to Mr. Gale. What about? Well, it was a personal matter. You thought he was going to spill the beans about you, so you plugged him, didn't you? Nothing of the kind. Ah, listen, wait, you... Wait, Mr. Burbank. There is a bullet missing from this gun. When did you fire it? Uh, last night. You see, I've been somewhat nervous lately, and last night I thought a burglar was climbing into my bedroom window. I reached for my gun and shot it. After snapping on the lights, I found it was only a cat. Say, do you expect us to swallow a yarn like that? Well, it's the truth. Where were you when this shooting took place? In the washroom. Can you prove that? Was anybody else there? I don't think so. I can't remember. Nobody else there, huh? After all, Danny, one can hardly be criticized for going to the lavatory alone. 
Ah, cut out the wise crack. All right, Burbank, that's all for the time being. Bring in the next one. Why did you think that Gaylord was going to spout anything about you over the radio tonight? Why? Well, because he'd been attacking me in this column. What's he been attacking you about? Oh, don't embarrass the gentleman, Benny. What does anyone ever attack a crooner about? Ah, lay off, will you? Where were you when the shooting took place? Why, I was outside that door, talking to Miss Oxford. What was you talking to her about? Why, it was a private matter. Won't be so private when we get through with it. How did you came here tonight to keep Gaylord from talking? Now, what are you afraid of? You should know better than to expect me to answer a question like that, Benny. Now, cut out the wisecrack. Why did you come here? To have an audition. My friends tell me I have an excellent baritone voice. How about this, Ernie? I have a permit, Commissioner. Besides, it's never been fired. I haven't done any shooting in years. Speaking of your shooting, where's Tony Stigger tonight? Oh. Well, I'm afraid Tony is out killing a few... Killing a few what? A few bottles. You'd be surprised what this good liquor is under, Tony. Where was you when this shooting took place? You found that out when you questioned Reynolds. And that's all I know, gentlemen. And where were you when the shooting took place? I was walking back and forth in the corridor. Outside that door. You see anybody try to come through that door? Nobody. And incidentally, I might inform you that all the people going back and forth in the corridor saw me at one time or another. Pretty smart boy, aren't you? And you had no opportunity to bump off Gaylord. No opportunity and uh, no motive. By the time my men caught up with the messenger boy, it already posted the mail. Now, who was that stuff going to? I don't remember. There were several packages of Mr. Gaylord. They were all registered, and the boy took a record of them. No, they were not all registered. Three of them were sent ordinary mail and addressed to general delivery. Now, who were they going to? Oh, I don't know, Mr. O'Brien. I send out hundreds of letters and packages a day from Mr. Gaylord. It'd be pretty hard to keep track of them all. Well, of course, Miss Oxford, we understand. Might I ask you uh, what you were talking about to Mr. Dale time the murder was committed? Well, I'd rather not say. You'd better say if you know what's good for you. I think it'd be wise if you told us, Miss Oxford. It would establish an alibi for Mr. Dale and incidentally for yourself. Very well. I'll tell you the truth. Before the murder happened, Mr. Dale was offering me $15,000 to let him into Mr. Gaylord's room. Sure, and you took the money. I didn't do anything. No, I'm sure you didn't, Miss Oxford. Now tell me, what was your explanation of the crime? Oh, I don't know. But I do know that somebody here murdered George. And I want to see his murderer punished. Why, sure. Certainly. Well, Miss Birdback, I want you to realize we're just trying to find a guilty person. And clear your father and you, just like all the rest of the innocent people here. Could you hear the broadcast from where you were standing? Yes. There was a door open just down the hall. Hmm. How long were you standing in the corridor outside the door before you heard the shot over the radio? About five or six minutes. Hmm. During that time, did you hear the latch click from the inside? Mm -hmm. No, I didn't. I'd like to try a little experiment. Commissioner, would you mind stepping into the corridor for a minute, please? Sure. <laughs> Did you hear the sound of the lock in the garden? Why, well, yes, well, of course you did. Although the room may be soundproof, the sound of the lock can be heard in the corridor. And the fact that Miss Burbank did not hear the sound is a very important clue. You mean it's a very important lie? On the contrary, Denny. If a smart young woman like Miss Burbank actually wanted to lie, she would have said that she did hear the click of the lock, thereby indicating that the murderer had come through another door. I don't follow you. Well, it's been definitely established that these three doors are kept locked on the inside during the broadcast. Yet these two were found open immediately after the murder. Well, it's obvious, therefore, that the murderer unlocked either one or both just to confuse the police. Well, that sounds reasonable. Yes. Now, if Miss Burbank knew that her father had come through this door and killed Gaylord, 
she would have said that she did hear the sound of the lock, thereby indicating that the murderer had come through another door and could not have been her father. As a matter of fact, Miss Burbank, when you came here, you were not concerned with your father at all or believed that he would kill Gaylord. Now, suppose you tell us just what you really were afraid of. Why, I... It might help your father's case. All right, then. I'll tell you. I came here because I was afraid Mr. Gaylord was going to tell that... that I was in Ed Cooper's apartment the night he killed himself. Hmm. Well, that's all for the time being. Say, why didn't you tell me that Dane was in Cooper's apartment? When did you find it out? I didn't find it out until she just told me. Well, but how did you get to... The very simple, Watson. When a girl goes to interview a columnist and ducks out of sight when she sees her father, it's very obvious that the business she's concerned with is not her father's business. More likely a monkey business. Never mind that. What are you going to do about this case? We can't keep those newspaper reporters out of here much longer, and everybody will be clamoring for an arrest. And they're going to get their arrest. I claim it's a dead open and shut case. Yeah, how do you figure that? Because everybody in these offices, except that Oxford dame and Halliburton, had a motive for killing Gaylord. And I claim that old man Burbank had the best motive. Now, Gaylord has spilled the beans about Burbank. His customers would have ruined his business. There's only one way out for an old man like Burbank, and that's to get Gaylord. Now, everybody in these offices around these corridors had an opportunity to kill Gaylord. And there are just two people without an alibi, Burbank and his daughter. Well, why don't you blame the daughter? For the same reason I don't blame the rest of these people. And it's for means for a murder. Don't forget, Burbank's gun is the only one that's been fired. Well, I think you've got a pretty good case, Denny. There's only one thing that bothers me, this bullet. Why is it so flattened and misshapen? Because it wasn't fired into the wall, it was pounded into the wall by the murderer who wanted to make us believe that the victim had been shot, not stabbed. Ah, fully. While we're asking the whys of things, Commissioner, I'd like to know why there was no evidence of gun smoke or powder smell in the room when the doors were open. Or why a bullet like that could possibly leave a wound that would make an experienced medical examiner believe was caused by a knife. Well, how do you explain it, Bill? Well, I can't explain it. Except that I know the murder was committed by a very clever person who deliberately left clue after clue just to baffle the police. I'm convinced that the victim was stabbed in spite of what we heard over the radio. Where's the knife? Oh, I don't know. Any more than I know the whys of the warehouse and the hocus pocus about these doors or the spot on the floor. Hello, Jack. Bill Hamilton. You get the analysis of that spot on the rug? Don't clean. Spot on the floor was water. <laughs> sure. And I suppose the guy murdered Gaylord by throwing water in his face. Well, I'm sorry, Bill. You tried hard. But I'm sure Denny's got a case we can take before the grand jury. All right, Commissioner. Uh, Burbank, I arrest you for the murder of George Gaylord. That's my duty to tell you that anything you say might be used against you. But he didn't do it. He didn't do it, I tell you. You had to arrest someone, so you're, you're picking on my father. Don't worry, Hunter. I'm sorry. And you? I thought you were helping me out. I thought you were my friend. And all the time you were just leading me on to set a trap to catch my father. Now, come in. Good morning, Commissioner. Oh, hello, Denny. Oh. Well, why all the optimism? It's more like a morgue than a commissioner's office. Ah, well, you stick around here for a little while, you'll find out why. This attorney is on his way down from upstairs. He's worried. Well, I don't blame him. If I were in his shoes and the grand jury asked me to prosecute a man on the flimsy evidence we have in this case, well, maybe the evidence wouldn't be so flimsy if you'd contribute a little bit to it. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Nevin? Come on, sir. Uh, you know Mr. Hamilton? Yes, of course. All right, Mr. Bryan. Yeah. Boys, we've got to have more evidence before we go to trial with this case. Well, Mr. Nevin, I thought we had given you quite a bit of evidence. We've shown that Burbank had a motive, 
He had the best opportunity of any to suspect. In his pocket, we find a gun from which a bullet had been fired. He has no alibi for the time of the murder. I grant all that. But will it be enough to convince the jury? Now, don't forget, we've had a lot of unsolved murders in this town during the last year. The taxpayers are kicking, and the opposition press is howling itself for it. Now, we've got to get a conviction, or we'll all be in hot water. Well, you can be assured, Mr. Nevins, that we'll do everything we can. All right, then. Chief, I can't do it all. I've got to have some help from the department. Say, what's the matter with you, Bill? You're not helping us at all. Well, I'm sorry, Commissioner. I'm doing everything I can, but I just don't know where to begin. Yeah, you've got a lot of those fancy ideas. You don't believe that Burbank is guilty. I understand now, Bill. But this office has got to work as a unit. Even though we convict an innocent man, is that it? I'm sorry, Commissioner. You know, one of those old-fashioned things called a conscience. I see here, Bill. I'm getting tired of this. Either you help us, or get out of the department. All right, Commissioner. I have my resignation in 20 minutes. So long, Sherlock. I better get out of here before your case falls down and you arrest me for the murder. William Hamilton calling. Oh, so Mr. Hamilton in, but... Hello, Mr. Redbank. I got your message. How do you do, Mr. Hamilton? I'm so glad you came. I really didn't think you would. You didn't think I would? Why not? Well, after that silly scene I put on at the Radio Playhouse. Oh, forget about it. I knew you were upset about your father. <laughs> oh, won't you sit down? Yeah, thanks. I was so sorry to read that you lost your job over this case. Oh, well, what's the difference? Considering the methods they're using at the homicide squad, I'd have lost it sooner or later anyway. I want to ask you something, and I want you to tell me honestly. Do you really think they'll convict my dad? Well, that's hard to say. If the jury looks on it the way headquarters does, anything might happen. I'm afraid of that, too. I've been so worried ever since they arrested him. Well, Miss Burbank, I wouldn't cross any bridges until I came to them, if I were you. Why well, worry about things unless, until you have to? It's so hard not to worry, especially with all the things that have been going on around here lately. Going on? What yes, do you mean? The, the publicity, the curiosity seekers, and the reporters hanging around all the time. And a few nights after Dad was arrested, a burglar broke into the house. Oh, well, if it's burglars you're worrying about, I wouldn't worry if I were you. You see, I happen to be the burglar. You? Yes, you see, I sneaked into the house here the other night to check up on that story of your father's about shooting at the cat. Mm -hmm. He told the truth. Did you tell the police? No, what's the use? That dumb fuck O'Brien would say that I manufactured the evidence. O'Brien and that bunch want everything but the truth. I tried to get them to run down some clues that really meant something. I showed them discrepancies in the case against your father, but no. Instead of letting clues lead them to a suspect, they jump a suspect and twist the clues to fit. I understand, Mr. Hamilton. You'd have come here this afternoon. I think our interests in this case are just about the scene. Naturally, I want to see my father acquitted and... You, to justify your opinion, want to see him acquitted and the real murderer caught. Yes, of course. Well, don't you suppose we could work together on this case? You could sort of be my private detective. Well, that would look rather funny, wouldn't it, for an ex-cop to go over to the other side? Well, what do you care? They gave you a raw deal, and now's your chance to show them up. Well, that makes you think that I could. Oh, I know you could. You were the only person I talked to in the police department that had enough sense to use the head on his shoulders. Oh, thank you. Please. You're the only one I have to turn to. All right, I'll do it. Oh, I know we can get it, the truth of it. I'll introduce you to Mr. Burnside, Dad's attorney, and then... Oh, but I'd better tell you, since Dad's arrest and the bankruptcy and everything, I don't know just when I'll be able to pay you or how much. Well, suppose you let me worry about that. And speaking of worrying, I want you to stop it from now on and let me do it for you. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I'm the best little worrier in the world. Well, if you say so. I do say so. And hereafter, if anything comes up that bothers you, I want you to call me up and I'll sit right down and worry. <laughs> <laughs> I feel relieved already. You know, I like you a lot, Bill. <laughs> well, you're not so unpopular yourself, Courtney. Uh, Miss Burbank. <laughs> Goodbye. He was walking from the transverse corridor to the main one. Oh. And in going from the transverse corridor to the main 
corridor, Mr. Halliburton would have to pass the side door of the broadcasting room. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Was this before or after the murder? Oh, it was before the murder, of course. Your Honor, I object to this line of questioning. Mr. Halliburton is not on trial. The counsel's question are a waste of time. The state grants that Miss Burbank was seen going into the transverse corridor. Objection sustained. Counsel for the defense will please confine his remarks to the points at issue. Very good, sir. Now, Miss Burbank, tell us what you were doing in this car. Well, I peeked around the corner and saw that my father was listening to the broadcast from the monitor room. So then I became interested in the broadcast myself. Of course, after the murder, there was so much confusion that... At any time, did you see your father leave or enter the side door of the broadcasting room? I did not. Thank you, Miss Burbank. That'll be all. Your witness. No questions. As for the testimony of Cornelia Burbank, it's only logical to suppose that a daughter would protect her father, even if she saw him entering or leaving the lethal room. Now, the counsel of defense forgets that Jerome Burbank is the only suspect who had no alibi for the minutes during which the crime was committed. Now, that fact, connected with his motive and his threats against the life of the deceased, as well as the gun with the discharged cartridge which was found in his possession, must compel you, gentlemen, to bring in a speedy verdict of murder in the first degree. I think, <coughs> Your Honor. <coughs> That's a pretty good story, Sorry, Bill, you just picked the wrong side. Oh, Halliburton, I want to congratulate you. I read about you taking over Gaylord's column. I was one of his fans. Thanks, O'Brien. I only hope I can do half as well with the column as poor old George did. What is it? The solution of the murder and every one of my clues fit. Now think carefully, Cornelia. How long was it before you heard the shot over the radio that you saw Halliburton in the corridor? Why, about five minutes. But you forget, Bill. Gaylord was alive then. No, he wasn't. If I find what I expect to find in the post office, how can I get my evidence to the judge before the jury brings in a verdict? We might see Evans there and that dumb Bill O'Brien and all the suspects in the case. I know, Bill. You've got to do it. I have some things to check up and I'll be back in a half an hour. This procedure is, of course, a trifle irregular. But if, as the counsel for the defense assures me, he has discovered new evidence, I am sure the district attorney will agree to recalling the jury or granting a new trial. If, on the other hand, the evidence is not material, no harm has been done. You may proceed, Mr. Burnside. I should like you to hear Mr. Hamilton, who's been associated with me in the defense. Mr. Hamilton. Thank you. I've asked Mr. Burnside to call this little session because I've discovered who actually killed George Gaylord and the manner in which the murder was committed. Now, since the beginning, there have been several baffling facts or clues connected with the case. Namely, Gaylord's statement that he had been shot when a competent medical examiner believed that he had been stabbed. The fact that there was no odor or no evidence of gun smoke in the room. The unlocked doors to Gaylord's office and the water spot on the floor. Let us consider these points one by one. It's natural to presume that Gaelic was shot because he said so. After all, a dying man should know what's happening to him better than anyone else. However, because of the absence of the gun smoke in the room and the statement by Dr. Chance, I was convinced that the victim was stabbed by someone who wanted to conceal the issue by making us believe he had been shot. This was further proved by the bullet which was hammered, not fired, into the wall. Ah, oh, we heard all that, Louis, before. Please let Mr. Hamilton continue. 
Now as to the fact of the unlocked doors. We all know that the murderer didn't have to come in through two doors or three. Yet, when we find two doors of the room unlocked and one locked, it's not difficult to presume that they were left that way to baffle the police. It's also logical to suppose that since the murderer is leaving misleading clues, the locked door was actually the door through which the murderer entered the room. Now, what are we to deduct from these facts? We all know that the murderer could not come through a locked door, and the murderer had no key. Moreover, there were witnesses in the ante room outside that locked door. Then, the murderer was admitted to the room by Gaylord himself. How then could the murderer possibly stab Gaylord and compel the victim to say that he had been shot? We shall see. As we're all pressed for time, I won't play all of this at present. And now, my friends, we come to the piece de resistance. Our story is about a moth which has flown around the bright light for a long time without singeing its wings. I am confident, however, that the glare from the spotlight of publicity will enkindle enough heat to melt the wings and crumble the feet of clay. Already, folks, here's the yarn. It's about... Stop! Stop! Don't kill me! Don't shoot! Please! I have ascertained that Gaylord made a record of his broadcasts every day during rehearsals. Just in case he needed them for future reference. The murderer got hold of the record that Gaylord had made the day he was killed. We recorded it, cut off the sensational story, imitated Gaylord's voice, and recorded a revolver shot. Denny, when I told you that the victim had been stabbed, you kept asking where the knife was. All right, I'll tell you. The knife was the water spot on the carpet. Why? It should be easy for us to deduct the identity of the accomplice in the murder, namely the only person who would be admitted into Gaylord's office. Sally Oxford. And since Gaylord was murdered several minutes before we heard the shot over the radio, it's obvious that nobody's alibi for the time of the murder means anything. This is especially true of Hugh Halliburton's alibi. He was not outside the middle door at the time of the murder, but was seen by Miss Burbank leaving the transverse corridor immediately after the real murder had been committed. You're not trying to accuse me of... Not only am I accusing you, Mr. Halliburton, but I'll tell you how it was done. Now, let us go back to Gaylord's office at the time of the murder. While Paddock, Reynolds, Burbank, and Dale were in Gaylord's outer office, waiting to see Gaylord, the buzzer on Miss Oxford's desk sounded, and Halliburton sauntered out into the corridor as Gaylord unlatched the door and admitted Miss Oxford. After admitting Miss Oxford, Gaylord walked back to the microphone and stood with his back to the center door while Miss Oxford came over and talked to him for a moment. Gaylord then asked Miss Oxford to mail some Christmas packages for him. He went over, took up the packages, walked to the center door. There, with Gaylord's back still turned to her, she carefully and quickly unlatched it. In the corridor outside, Halliburton, hearing the door unlatched, went to the window and obtained a large icicle. Meanwhile, Miss Oxford was leaving the inner office. Halliburton then opened the door noiselessly, entered the room, sneaked up behind Gaylord, and stabbed him through the neck. Meanwhile, in the outer office, Miss Oxford had her part to play. The men were probably arguing with her as a result of Gaylord's refusal to see them. She turned her attention away from them and phoned for a messenger boy. Inside, Halliburton put the icicle on or near the heat radiator, knowing that it would melt quickly. He then took a soft-nosed bullet from his pocket and with a some heavy object, hammered the bullet into the wall at an angle to coincide with the spot where Gaylord had been standing. Next, he took a record from his coat and put it on the phonograph. When preparing the record, Halliburton had left enough of it unrecorded or blank to run soundlessly until the time for the beginning of the broadcast. After looking at his watch and starting the record at the proper time, he unlatched the side door and went out, leaving it unlatched behind him. We all know what happened next. Gaylord was supposedly shot. Miss Oxford took advantage of the excitement caused by the murder to cover up a tracks. After the murder, Gaylord's outer office was a scene of confusion. 
Miss Oxford and the others were unable to open the door to the inner office until the radio officials arrived on the scene with a key. The officials opened the door and went in, followed by Miss Oxford and the others. While everyone's attention was concentrated on the body of the dead man, she took the record from the phonograph, concealed it behind her, and sneaked into the outer office. She then quickly slipped the record into a folder, which had previously been prepared and addressed gave it to the messenger boy and hurried him on his way. Miss Oxford was as clever in this as in everything else. She knew that the officers, as well as herself, would be searched. Therefore, she mailed the record to herself in care of general delivery, expecting to pick it up at the post office after the excitement had died down. When I deduced the existence of the record and knew that it had been disposed of, I suddenly understood the meaning of the Christmas packages having been mailed to general delivery. Naturally, Miss Oxford further threw suspicion from herself by addressing the package to her real name, Sally Jones, which she did not expect to come out in court. It's a very pretty story, Mr. Hamilton, but it proves absolutely nothing. On the contrary, Mr. Halliburton, although you were very careful to remove all your fingerprints, Miss Oxford made one bad slip-up. She neglected to take her fingerprints off the record. I had them photographed at the Identification Bureau. I told you. Yes, we did kill him. But he deserved to die. He ruined the lives of thousands of people. And besides that, your lover, Mr. Halliburton, was promised Mr. Gaylord's job, providing he could get rid of the columnist. Arrest these two people for the murder of George Gaylord. Your Honor, the state agrees to the dismissal of the jury and the discharge of the defendant, Jerome Burbank. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Oh, Bill, you were wonderful. How can I ever thank you? Oh, forget about it. Don't bother. Say, is it true what you told me about your father being broke? Why, yes. But does it make any difference? I'll say it does. I don't want anybody to say that I proposed to you on account of your money. Oh, Bill. <laughs> hey, Bill, where's that medical examiner? They told me he was here. Well, I don't know, Commissioner. He isn't here. Is there anything wrong? Uh, well, I'll say. That dumbbell O'Brien still doesn't believe you can hurt anybody with an icicle. He darn near killed himself trying to prove it. 